Welcome. Welcome everyone to this public scoping meeting that we're holding tonight on the management of scop, black sea bass, and summer flounder, as well as striped bass. And so, you know, why are we here? Um, this is kind of an annual exercise that we go through at the Division of Marine Fisheries because of these annual adjustments that are made to the management of specifically the, the first three species, uh, fluke, scup, and sea bass. Uh, those species are managed in conjunction with the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, along with the ASMFC. And because of, of Magnuson, uh, we have to do these annual adjustments in order to try to hit the target uh, catch levels attributable to the recreational fishery. So um, there's never enough time uh, to do this through normal rulemaking because we usually don't get the estimates of catch until the end of the calendar year. Our normal regulations take about uh, five or six months to fully promulgate. So we're forced to do what we call emergency regulations. But what we're doing tonight, and we do at this time every year, is hold this kind of an informational hearing so that we can get your feedback uh, and try, to, especially if there's consensus, um, so that when I go to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission at their March meeting, I will be making um, uh, basically a proposal, or I'm going to I'm going to be telling them what I intend to do, um, mostly based on um, the the written comments that we receive, as well as tonight's uh, public uh, comments live here on this webinar, and. Uh, enact emergency regulations for the upcoming season. Um, it's just the, the quirk of, of the rulemaking process, but we literally do this uh, every year. We don't usually do it for striped bass because we don't usually have an annual adjustment like we do with those other three species. Um, and we, we never do it for tatog and, you know, in terms of these like annual uh, tunings of, of bag size and seasons, but it's what we do. So thank you everyone for attending on the screen right now is um, the schedule. You can see here that the uh, ASMFC has approved a range of options in January. And so when we were prescribed with levels of cuts, you know, we came up with what we thought were a full array of possible measures. So we floated those to the, uh, to the uh, ASMFC and um, and got those approved. So what we're going to show you tonight is among those things that we can do. Um, you know, let's 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 pick one or or tell us what you like and why. And so the written comment on these uh, these ideas is going to uh, stay open till March seventh, and then on March nineteenth, our Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission is going to meet, and and we're going to. Uh, talk about these issues, I'm gonna to try to get their consensus because you know, once this goes in as an emergency, three months, within three months, I have to enact a final. And uh, as I'll explain to the commission, you can't change your mind mid season because by then we'll, we'll put out all the information on the, uh, to the tackle shops and to the, and, and the social media, et cetera. So we need to, whatever we do by emergency really needs to stick in order, you know, for the good of the order during the summer fishery. So, um, so that's the plan on, on the 19th to uh, get consensus from the commission or at least a majority position. I'll take that to an emergency reg. On striped bass, um, same thing. Uh, the, the commission actually uh, voted addendum two. Uh, we don't need to make any changes to our, you know, bag or our size range, our, our slot, but there was uh, some language about belaying of striped bass. And so, Tonight, we want to get your input on some of the filleting rules and how we can comply with that. Um, this has been, you know, kind of a gray area for a long time. Uh, Nico has done uh, some good research on the kind of language that exists in other states. And so we'll be looking for your input on that. Again, that'll be an emergency rule as well. Uh, and, and so for both of these packages, you'll see a hearing, you know, probably sometime in May or June but it'll be sort of a, just a formality because the expectation is whatever we pass uh, at the March meeting will be the rule for the year. 
So without further ado, um, I'll introduce uh, Nicola Meserve to uh, present some of the options by species. Nicola is my proxy uh, on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, board that, that covers these species. Uh, she and Mike Armstrong and I are the, are, the, um, are the three agency people that routinely attend those, along with the other two members of our delegation, uh, Sarah Peake, uh, the representative from Provincetown, and Ray Kane, our, our chairman of our Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. So Nicola, the the, uh, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, and thank you to the members of the public for being here tonight. Um, I'm gonna walk us through the presentation. Um, we're gonna take a pause after Fluke, Scup, and Seabass to do question and, co and comment on those species first before we move on to striped bass in case anyone you know wants to be done with one part at that point. Um, and along with the other DMF staff members on on the meeting tonight, we'll we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have um, about this. So a little more over introduction as to why we're here. Um, as Dan was saying, there are interstate and federal management plans for these species, and under them, this year we are required for summer flounder as a coast to take a 28% reduction in recreational harvest. For SCUP, it's a coastwide 10% recreational harvest reduction. And for black sea bass, the requirement is for status quo recreational measures. The interstate plan does prescribe a little bit more detail about how those types of coastwide requirements are taken. In the case of summer flounder, um, there are six different management regions. Uh, Massachusetts is its own region. And so uh, single-handedly, we can design our rules for that 28% reduction that's being assigned to each region. Um, you know, that differs from a region that's multi-state where the, all the states within the region have to have the exact the same regulations. With SCUP, there's just three regions. Um, we work with Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York to come up with very similar um, measures. It's not a requirement that they be identical, but the measures that we strive to achieve as a region are, are very similar. So we're work we worked to come up with a set of options to, within that region, achieve the 10% harvest reduction. And for black sea bass, while the ma the mandate is for status quo recreational measures, um, states are permitted to request um, minor seasonal adjustments, provided they're not expected to increase harvest, um, such as to make sure that an important holiday weekend is in the season or to start on a Saturday. So you'll see that we do have one option um, for black sea bass as well. For striped bass, um, it's, it's that... Um, the flaying aspect of addendum two that we'll be talking about at the at the end of the of the meeting. Um, I wanted to just address the topic of um, you know how these reductions are are est, uh, predicted and, and determined for summer flounder scup and black sea bass. Um, I often hear that with scup biomass so high, why are we taking our reduction? With black sea bass, why can't we liberalize? Um, and so, you know, it's important to remember that we do have a, a recreational harvest limit for each of these species um, that's based on the stock assessment, the biomass level, and um, the setting of an annual catch limit that's expected that it won't cause overfishing, which is then allocated between the commercial and recreational sectors. Um, once we have that recreational harvest limit, the process calls for uh, comparing what the projected harvest would be if we didn't change the measures to that recreational harvest limit. And essentially, if we project that harvest is going to exceed the recreational harvest limit, we need to restrict the rules to reduce harvest. This differs from the commercial management of these species where there is a quota, where there's an in-season closure when the quota is reached. Rather, with these species, we have to, before the fishery starts, um, estimate measures that are expected to stay within within the recreational harvest limit. Within the last year, however, biomass is considered at additional an additional time in this process, uh, such that stocks that have higher biomass levels get a little bit um, better, more favorable treatment in terms of not having to take as much of a cut or being able to liberalize more based on that that healthy biomass level, whereas stocks that are below their target level um, don't get that same leeway. 
So turning to this year for both summer flounder and scup, both of these species have projected harvest for this year that it's expected to exceed their limit under status quo measures. For summer flounder, because stock biomass, according to the last stock assessment, is below the target level, the, the mandate is to reduce coastwide harvest all the way down to that harvest limit, which is the 28% harvest reduction. For scup, on the other hand, we have a very high biomass level, more than 150% of the target. And so in this case, the coastwide reduction is capped at 10% rather than the larger 18% cut that would be needed to get down to the harvest limit. Importantly, um, we have um, changed the process a little bit where this is the first year that we're actually setting two-year measures for summer flounder and scup. So whatever is set for 2024, those measures are going to stay in place for 2025. Um, black sea bass was expected to be in a similar situation um, in that two-year process. However, the stock assessment was delayed. And so the management board determined that because we took a 10% cut last year, we're going to treat 2024 like the second year of that two-year process and hold the management measures stable. So this table outlines um, kind of the starting part, starting point for the development of regulations for this year. These are the Massachusetts regulations that were in place last year, as well as the, the change that is needed, which I just summarized. And we'll go through these, these each one at a time. For summer flounder, um, our 2023 rules were uniform across all modes. And by that, I mean, whether you're fishing from shore, a private vessel or a for hire vessel, the same season bag and minimum size limit applied, which was May 21st to September 29th, a five fish bag limit and a minimum size of 16 and a half inches. Those measures are projected to uh, produce a harvest of around 190,000 pounds this year. And it's from that number that we have to reduce by 28%. So in starting to look at the types of measures that we could use to achieve that 28% harvest reduction, um, we first looked at you know, what changing each measure alone does for us. So on the far left, we have size limit changes. If you increase the size limit by half an inch, that produces a 13% harvest reduction. If you go up to 17 and a half inches, a whole inch increase, that's a 26% reduction. It's, it's nearly the 28% the reduction that we need. And an 18 inch size limit does more than we need. In the middle, the bag limit changes. Going from five fish to four fish only gives you a 3% um, harvest reduction, which is indicative of how few people are actually taking the full five fish bag limit. Um, stepping down to three, a three fish bag limit is an 8% reduction, and then you start to get a bigger bang for your buck by going to two fish, it's an 18% reduction. We looked at, you know, some season changes just to get an idea of, of how that also affects the harvest reduction. If you take off those days in May, that's a 3% reduction. If you bump the season start all, all the way to July 1st, that's an 18% reduction. You would actually have to go to July 12th to get a full 28% reduction by a season alone from the front end. Similarly, if you chopped off the end of the season on, on Labor Day weekend, that's a 6% reduction and you'd have to close the season on August 16th um, to get the full 28% reduction just through a seasonal closure. So using this type of information, we worked to develop a, a suite of options that for the most part looked at trade-offs between um, size limit and bag limit. And so before I get to that, I did wanna quickly just look at you know where we've been with summer flounder management. Um, we have had a, a size limit as high as 18 and a half inches within the last 20 years, but it's been more commonly 17, 17 and a half inches. Um, we've been pretty consistent with a five fish bag limit since 2007, except for one year where there was a four fish limit. And in the last 12 years or so, we've been able to maintain a season that's late May to you know mid-September at least. When you compare our regulations to other states, um, we do have, in as of last year, you know, one of the lower size limits and one of, and the highest bag limit along the coast. Um, so each of the states' regulations that you see here in this this table of 2023 measures, all those states are also going to be changing their rules. So you can expect that you know there's going to be minimum size increases or bag limit reductions or seasonal cuts for for all those other states as well. So moving on to the the options that we developed, the first one. Um, uses a size limit increase of one inch from 16 and a half to 17 and a half inches to achieve 
that most of the cut and then it just requires an additional nine days of the season to be taken off to achieve a, a 28% reduction. Um, you'll see here that May 24th date is used a number of times. May 24th is the Friday before uh, Memorial Day weekend in 2024, and it's the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend in 2025, so that's why that was selected. Um, option two also uses the one-inch size increase, but goes down to a four-fish bag in order to not shorten the season in the same way that option one does. It's not a huge difference, though, because, again, going from five-fish to four-fish doesn't provide much of a benefit in terms of a harvest reduction. Option three, um, you know, looks at just a half an inch increase and what would be required to achieve the cut, which is a, a three fish bag limit, as well as a shortening of the season. Um, these seasonal reductions were a little bit more significant than you know what you had to look at in option number one. So there was a, a number of kind of options presented to get an idea of, you know, to provide some different, do we want to cut from the front or cut from the back? So 3A, you know, maintains that many May 24th start and goes through August 27th. Option B looked at getting the fishery to Labor Day, and that required starting on June 5th. Option C looked at getting to mid-September, and that required starting on June 11th. And then option D looked at keeping the current closing date, and that required starting on June 18th. Initially, we had also developed an option that would allow us you know, no change in the minimum size. Um, so it would have stayed 16 and a half inch for all modes, um, but that would require a two fish bag limit and the similar seasons as you see in option three. Um, understandably, that two fish limit would not be very attractive to the four higher fleet in particular, so we didn't include that option for scoping. However, we did use it at the basis of option four, which presents a mode split in which the the for higher fleet achieves you know its share of the reduction through a minimum size increase maintaining the five fish limit and the private and shore modes achieve their share of the reduction with a bag limit reduction to two fish these also require um, those shortening of the seasons though so you see the same range of options for for the season length um, notably, um, the shore mode, there's so little um, harvest from shore that for each of these options, the 16 and a half inch size limit is maintained for the shore and that doesn't impact, you know, the reduction that we're trying to achieve. Um, and so that, you know, keeping it at 16 and a half inches responds to the reduced availability of larger fish along the shore. So just in terms of trying to analyze these options just a little bit, um, you can look at the harvest, the projected harvest and dead releases from each option. If you're, you know, want to think about picking an option that's not going to end up with a lot of dead, more dead releases um, and instead encourage more harvest, the results showed that um, the options with a lower size limit, you know, closer to 16 and a half inches where it is now, um, were, the, were the options that produced um, more harvest and less dead releases, which makes sense intuitively as you increase the minimum size, you're going to drive up um, releases in order to catch a keeper size fish. So um, there's not, it's not a huge difference between the options, as you can see, what you're seeing in this graph in blue is the harvest that's associated with each of the options. The orange bars are the dead releases um, associated with each option. Um, please note that the, the Y axes for these two um, quantities are, are, are different. And so the dead releases are not actually exceeding the harvest level for these options. It's just the way they're portrayed on this graph so that you can see the, the interannual variability a little bit better. If you look at those figures by the private vessel compared to the four higher vessel, though, you do see a little bit of a, of a difference um, in, in those data points. The, the graph on the left shows the private, left, private vessel harvest and dead releases that's projected with each of these options. And that graph looks very similar to the one on the, on the previous page. Whereas if you look at the four higher um, on the right, we see that the options with a three fish bag limit and a 17 inch um, size limit are the ones that um, promoted more harvest and less dead releases overall.
but again, the the private vessel um, it harvest is it what is what dominates um, the catch in this fishery. So the, it's the private vessel results that really drive you know how many harvests and and how much dead uh, dead releases there are. Moving on to SCUP, um, our rules in 2023 included a, a season of May 1st to December 31st, uh, along with a 30 fish bag limit with an exception uh, for the four higher bonus season as we call it, which during May and June, the bag limit is 40 fish. There is a difference in the minimum size based on where you're fishing from along the shore, nine and a half inches applies, whereas from vessels it's 10 and a half inches. Uh, for scup, we have you know much more significant harvest than summer flounder, uh, around 1.7 million pounds estimated to be taken in 2024 under the status quo measures, um, and so from there is where we're reducing again as a region um, by 10%. Similarly, similarly, we looked at um, the type of reductions you get from each change alone. So again, on the left, the size limit changes a half inch increase to the vessel based modes only. So that would be taking the private vessel and the four higher vessel size limit up to um, 11 inches minimum produces a, a 6% reduction in Massachusetts. If you also apply that to the shore mode, um, you get some more savings there and it achieves a 10% reduction. So if Massachusetts were its own region for SCUP, everyone, you know, all the modes going up half an inch would be an option for us to achieve a 10% reduction. Um, and the bag limit changes, um, you you don't really, you have to go quite low on the bag limit to get a sizable reduction. Again, indicating that not many people are taking um, these bag limits. Um, if you were to go down to 20 fish, um, it's mostly the shore mode that's being impacted, but you only get a 2% reduction overall. Drop it another five fish down to a fish, 15 fish limit. Um, while leaving that bonus at 40 fish, you only get a three or 4% reduction. Um, taking out some season, you have to go quite drastically at the end of the season to get a reduction. For example, closing all of September through December through December to get a 12% a reduction. Um, whereas taking out two weeks on the front end provides a 7% reduction, 8% reduction. As a region, though, with Rhode Island and Connecticut and New York, we decided that we would not look at a season um, shortening uh, to achieve the reduction that we need because there would be disproportionate impacts between uh, the states in the region. Um, May is very important to our, our for hire fleet, for example, whereas November, December has more uh, importance to their for hire fleets. So the options that we develop look primarily at um, a bag or a size limit change to achieve a 10% reduction as a region. Um, looking again, just where we've been with SCUP, the rules have been pretty steady um, for, for a number of years. The, you know, the bag limits haven't changed that much. There's been some fluctuation in the size limit. Um, the size limit has been the major tool with which we've you know, achieved uh, reductions or, or liberalizations over the years. Um, and the, looking at the the 2023 measures, um, you see how Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York measures are the same as ours with the exception of that for higher bonus season applying in September and October. So this table provides the, the options that we developed um, as a region. Number one um, is, I think fair to say the preferred option going in. Um, it's an 11 inch size uh, limit for the private vessel and four higher vessel modes. Uh, so that's a half inch increase for, for those two modes, leaving the shore at nine and a half inches. While that only achieves you know, a 7% reduction in Massachusetts as a region, it provides a 10% reduction um, with New York contributing a little bit more to cover like the shortage in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and, and Connecticut. Um, and the impact to the private vessel, private vessel and for higher vessels is quite similar. So as a region though, we didn't only wanna present one option. So we did provide option number two, which looks at a bag limit reduction to achieve the 10% cut. And the option that we presented is a nine fish limit um, with the exception of a 20 fish limit for the for hire bonus mode. This, however, you can see, um, you know, has a much more significant impact on the for hire fleet and some pretty um, variable impacts 
um, by state. We also presented one more option that looked at opening up April, um, seeing as there's going to be a change in the rules this year where April, well, January through April are gonna be open in federal waters. So we presented this option just to have one more that opened up April. And uh, in order to account for that, there is a, a bag limit reduction to 20 fish, except the bonus season staying at 40 fish and a half inch increase. Um, this option did share the, the cut pretty evenly among the different modes and among the different states in the region. But again, I think um, option number one is the probably going to be the preferred option within the region. Um, it also does, option one, it does produce um, the, pro the highest projected harvest and the lowest projected dead releases in number of fish. And this is driven by, in Massachusetts, by the, the current dominance of the shore mode in terms of the number of fish taken. Lastly, black sea bass. Um, I have a lot less to say about black sea bass because we're much more restricted here. What we can do, again, it's just a, a seasonal refinement um, that we can do as long as it's not projected to increase harvest. And so the 2023 rules are option one. We don't have to make any change here, but we do provide option two, which moves the start date up two days um, in order to start on a Saturday, that's Saturday, May 18th. And in order to account for the additional harvest on that front end, we take four days off the season. So it would close September 3rd instead and the bag and minimum size stay the same. So that's that's our wrap up of the options and um, be happy to take questions before we, we get into any comment and um, on preferred options. So, Nicola, I'm sure you'll get requests to scroll back to mm -hmm. some of the individual species slides. So why don't we take some hands from the attendees and we'll um, try to answer some clarifying questions. Folks, if you would like to ask a question, you can just Put, use the raise hand function. Eric Morrow. Okay, thanks. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hey, Nicole. How you Hi, doing? Eric. Uh, question there. I'm, I'm sure it's going to go back to the MRAP data, of course. 54% of 1.7 million pounds of scup was landed from shore. We all know that's 100% incorrect. Um, so, I mean, that's uh, who, who, where did we get those numbers from? That was, that was from MRAP? Uh, well, that that's the projection of what would be taken in 2024 under the current rules. But but yes, um, MRIP is, you know, the the main one part of the data that's included in, in making these projections of harvest and, and discards. Um, it's not the only data, though. Um, the, the model that's being used to produce these numbers also accounts for angler behavior um, and how effort changes based on the rules that are set. It also accounts for the length frequency um, and year class strength. So it is an improvement. Um, this, these are recent improvements that have been made to the process, but um, the MRIP data, particularly kind of the last two years worth of data in terms of catch per trip um, are, you know, what's really uh, per, uh, informing the model. All right, no, I just, I'm always commenting from the Fahara fleet, but I've also opened the tackle shop last year. In Fairhaven, so you would think most of your shorebound scup people would go to a local New Bedford Fairhaven tackle shop. Um, maybe ten percent of our business is people looking for scup rigs and things like that. Most of them are striped bass or fluke and things like that. So, I have a broader range of what the angler is looking for, both recreational and for hire. And you know, I'm trying to contribute to what I see. Uh, one more quick question: I have a couple, but um, when we go to the uh, dead releases on fluke with the um, uh, mortality. Was that a Massachusetts study or was that uh, something we're using coastwise? Because we don't have the same fluke fishery as most of our neighboring states with shallow estuaries where people are using small bucktails and things that would gut hook a fluke. Uh, a lot of our fishing is deeper water, bigger current, big bucktails, big bait, big six, six inch gulps or six inch long fluke belly or whatever kind of bait. These fish aren't being gut hooked up here. I mean, I, I grew up down south, you know, New York, New Jersey area where the back bays and yeah, a lot of fish were gut hooks, but 
Is this a Massachusetts study or is this something we're grabbing from another state on this uh, mortality here? Uh, this uses uh, the, the coast-wide release mortality rate that's used in the stock assessment to drive these. So it does not right. take into consideration, you know, inshore versus offshore, you know, temperature variation. But, you know, on average, that it's the, I believe it's 10% that's used in the stock assessment for rod and reel release mortality. Right. Are we ever going to have any studies here? Because we've, we've been down this road with sea bass. We have to eat it on the sea bass because the New Jersey winter fishery or all these boats fishing in 100, 150 feet of water late in the season, all the fish are dead. We, we have to deal with that, dealing with the other states with mortality on sea bass. Now, the same thing's happening with the fluke. I mean, when are we ever going to be able to say we have a different fishery here in Massachusetts? Let's do our own studies and show that we're not killing a quarter of the fish that you think we are. I mean, it's this is too many differences of species of fish. We're just uh, riding along with what other states. I mean, New Jersey went and did their own thing a few years ago. And look at how they said they got the best yeah. bay limits on the East Coast. So, Eric, I, I think you're drifting into making a comment. So let's let's have you hold totally. that and let's let's see if there's any other questions on Nicholas presentation. No, any hands, Jared? Not saying anything, Dan. All right, so why don't we take one species at a time? Then let's go fluke. Let's take comments on the on on fluke first. And we'll. You got a hand up there. You got Dennis. Dennis Sabralis. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm not really good at this, but. <laughs> um, so we taking comments on options for the fluke. Is that what we're doing? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm into option one on the fluke. The five fish at 17 and a half inches seems like our best. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I just, I, I, it's just, uh, uh, kind of going back to what Eric said about, you know, just kind of the same thing with the sea bass where the mortality is definitely different here than it is in other states. You know, we use huge, huge, huge stuff here, which you, you don't really, you catch small, less smaller fluke and you, you got hook a lot less too, but I know, I know there's a study out or whatever you guys got. Thanks Dennis. All right. Jared, you got Willie? Willie Hatch. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing us to provide input. I'm um, speaking on behalf of the Cape Cod Charter Boat Association. We spoke about this, and we are all in favor of option one. We need the five fish. Uh, we need the May 24th start date and, you know, the long season going into September. Uh, we need the five fish to basically attract our customers from out of state. A lot of our guys come from New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia. Um, we're going offshore. The trips are expensive. The costs of coming here and doing trips, the traveling, the hotels, the meals. We got to have value to our trips. So uh, we need the highest bag limit we can get. The 17 and a half inches is uh, not a problem for us. So uh, we're all in favor of option one. Thanks. Thanks, Willie. Yep. Paul Diggins. Paul? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, my name's Paul Diggins. I'm a charter boat operator out of Charlestown, Massachusetts, and I'm also a member of the Stellwagen Bank Charter Boat Association. And uh, uh, option one would be the best for uh, for me and and my fellow members. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the 
proposed fluke options. If not, we would move into um, Scott. Eric, Eric you want to Yes, 100% uh, behind option one, just as Willie spoke about and Dennis spoke about. And um, I'm actually here with Keith Baker and uh, Keith Baker Jr., another captain that's here now, too. They're having a problem with their phone there. We're all an option, all in favor of option one. Uh, once again, we do need the bag limit. Uh, I was just in Philadelphia doing the Philadelphia Fishing Expo, and I'm pulling customers all the way down from Delaware. Um, you need okay. you need, you need, need to have the bag limit, guys, we're, we're, to get these people up here. So option one, and that's three or four people right here that have a little problem logging in. So, was, so far, it's unanimous. Yeah. Caleb Sabula. Hey there. Um, I'm also a charter boat captain, and I would also be in favor of option one. Uh, I think going anything lower than five would be detrimental, so I would agree with option one. All right. Well, it's message received here, so um, I guess we can move on to the second species. We'll assume that there, that's a consensus position among the participants. All right, Nick, let's talk about Scott. So Nick, do you want to talk yep. about Option, the, options uh, are on the board here? So if anyone wants to um, raise their hand to. Nick, do you want to steer the conversation a little bit to talk about um, our desire to have common rules with the other states, unlike the other two species and why? Um, well, <laughs> I guess that's it's the way that we've been able to do it. Um, the just the the management history has been as a region, um, you know, more consistent measures across states um, has an advantage towards equity uh, that we often hear about not having in terms of black sea bass, where it's been a very state by state approach in years past. Um, so we have continued to work as a region to maintain, you know, very similar regulations. At this point, it's not really an option for us to break away from that region and come up with an option. Uh, as Dan, Dan went on uh, with the timeline in the very beginning, you know, we've had a range of options approved. So um, we will be maintaining this regional approach for 2024 and carried forward into 2025. And Nicola, you're sort of revealing that when you um, have your conversations with the other states, there's a kind of a uh, gravitational pull toward option number one. Correct. Okay. Oh, but we didn't want to present just one option. So folks on the phone uh, or on the call, is there any ob ob strong objection to us working with the other two states and embracing this option number one and nicola mentioned it it kind of gets us a little less cut in the other states not that it's designed that way but um do, are there any is there any objection to that willie willie hi yeah i i mean we're definitely in favor of option one i'm just curious about Rhode Island. It seems like Massachusetts uh, majority of our bottom fishing is done in the spring, you know, wave three, May, June, whereas, you know, Rhode Island likes to take their sea bass and their scup more, you know, in the fall, September through December. So um, I don't know where, where they would, you know, where they would want to focus more of their efforts, but um, I know that for us, we would like option one. Thank you. From what I understand from some preliminary discussions in, in the other three states with um, stakeholders, option one um, was getting support, the most support there in the other three states as well. All right. So, um, I, I, you know, from what I've learned from Nicola and from the comments tonight, uh, we'll likely um, turn to our neighboring states and um, embrace 
number one. If there's no objection to that, we can uh, move on to that uh, that black sea bass discussion, or even though that's not much of a change at all. But Nicole, why don't you just show that one more time to reinforce it? Right. So this this option was, you know, developed largely because of input that I had from some members of the four hire fleet that they would like to maintain that Saturday start if possible. So I will, uh, you know, assume that the individuals I've heard speak thus far would, would be in support of option two. Any objections to that option? Go ahead, Dennis. I just wanted to say that uh, that that Saturday, the 18th there was just, I know it's only two days, but for a short window of our sea bass in the spring, and I know everyone will agree with me, it's just, it's super important we get those two days out of it. Yeah, we, we understand that. Okay, that's, that's yeah. all I um, Hey, Nick, uh, before we go to the, to the striped bass discussion, um, you know, Ben Gehagen uh, has communicated with me about the potential to do some um, uh, release mortality studies on things like fluke and black sea bass, similar to what we've done in striped bass. We've, we have a very successful uh, project going on right now. Ben, do you want to um, take a few minutes and, and talk about some of your vision? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, I just want to say, and kind of, I know an earlier speaker brought it up. Um, you know, as we're done with striped bass, and hopefully most people are familiar with our work there. We're always interested in using new and modern techniques to come up with better estimates of post-release mortality, and whether that's a new technique or maybe it is about gear-specific issues and regional-specific issues. There's things we can do to address that. Um, so if there are people who have thoughts about, you know, what makes, uh, you know, a fluke or black sea bass fishery in Massachusetts different, obviously, they have, you know, we talked, somebody talked about the New Jersey difference where there's greater depths for black sea bass. That's a consideration. Um, there may be merit to doing these types of studies. We're doing the striped bass study now, but moving forward, we've talked about and are certainly interested in focusing on other species. So please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. You can find me on the DMF website if you have input about those types of studies or might want to participate as a vessel operator or something like that. We're, we're looking to do these studies in the future where they're needed to improve management and, uh, and happy to work with people who are on the water every day. So that's really all I had to say. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Um, all right, let's move on to the striped bass section of the hearing tonight. Okay, sounds good. Um, so um, as we said, addendum two was uh, passed earlier this year. And uh, the aspect of it that we need to talk about is how it mandates that any state that allows filleting in the recreational fishery is now required to have some, some minimum standards for allowing that filleting and those are designed to help with the enforcement of, of size and possession limits and those requirements are that the racks be retained and that no more than two fillets be possessed per filleted fish. Um, as you know, in Massachusetts, we have a long-standing allowance for the for hire fleet to um, fillet fish for their customers, well, striped bass specifically, while at sea, provided that under our rules, the skin be left intact and intact and no more than two fillets be possessed per filleted fish. So what does this mean? It means that in order for us to retain that for hire filleting allowance, Massachusetts must adopt a rack retention requirement. Um, no exceptions. I've I've heard that there may be there's ideas or interest in something else like photographic evidence to show that the the fish was you know compliant with the size limit, but the plan does not provide for that type of um, alternative. So we have to go forward with a rack retention requirement um, to keep the for hire filleting allowance. Um, it is something that um, 
all the other states that specifically authorize at sea filleting and therefore higher fishery already have a rack retention requirement. So in thinking about how we would implement this in Massachusetts, I've certainly looked at the language in those other states to see how they have implemented it. And largely, we need to, you know, address those questions of when and where and how the racks are retained and then also subsequently disposed of. Our plan is to maintain we are, um, the intact skin requirement that we have, um, and we've already got the language about the, the two fillet maximum, so no changes required on that part. As part of this, we also want to clarify in our language, regulatory language, that flaying is not allowed in the general recreational fishery. Um, it is not our plan to extend the for hire allowance to other recreational fishing modes at this time. Um, we're in a kind of an era of heightened conservation right now with striped bass and looking for measures that are going to provide for optimal compliance and enforcement. Um, the rack retention requirement provides a mechanism to continue, you know, the for hire fleet providing the service to their clientele who often lack the technical or logistical ability to fillet fish and dispose of the racks, but um, allowing filleting with a rack retention requirement, you know, fishery wide would likely cause a you know, disposal refuse problem in the fishery. Um, however, the, the current language that we have in the rules um, isn't really clear that filleting is not allowed in the general recreational fishery. Um, right now it says that the there's no mutilation that prevents an accurate measurement of the striped bass allowed. And this can be misinterpreted as filleting allowed with the racks retained as that mechanism to get the accurate measurement. So we would want to clean that up. But again, we need to you know, be careful in the language to make sure that it's addressing when and, and where a harvested striped bass can be processed for consumption or, or storage um, after a fishing trip. So with regards to the, the for hire rack retention, you know, we're, we're trying to look at language from other states to kind of address the questions of what, when, and how are we going to uh, to, to require this. So the first question is kind of when can a for hire captain or crew fillet striped bass for their customers? Currently, our rule says um, while at sea, um, based on looking at some other states language, you know, a proposed modification would be to a little to be a little bit more flexible. Um, there could be circumstances where the for hire vessel due to you know weather or boat issues, you know, doesn't get the flaying done at sea. And so a language that says that it has to be flayed prior to customers leaving the vessel or the immediate dock area would provide a little bit more uh, flexibility there. The next question is in what condition the racks need to be retained once the, the flaying has occurred. So some other states have language that we are including as a proposal here that the racks have to be um, retained in a separate container, unmixed with any other material and readily available for inspection. And that the, um, the rack needs to be unmutilated in any manner that would interfere with the species identification or a length measurement from it. So once we know where the racks are being um, kept, uh, how long do they have to be retained? Looking at other state languages, um, I included a couple different you know, example language here. They all kind of do the same thing of the racks have to be ret retained until the, the end of the fishing trip, but they're worded a little bit differently. So New York and Maryland say until the vessel has docked and all passengers from that trip have left the vessel and the immediate dock area. New Jersey says, until the vessel has docked and been secured at the end of the fishing trip, adequate to provide a law enforcement officer access to inspect the vessel and catch. Pennsylvania says, until possession of the fish is transferred to the customer on shore. So, um, you know, if there is any input on why one of those may be, you know, better or worse, um, a very, you know, would let, much like to, to hear that from, from the from you all. Um, and lastly, um, you know how long, if you know how long the rack has to be retained, you know, is there a time where it has to be disposed of? And so some states include a language that the, the racks have to be disposed of 
um, prior to any person beginning to fish on a subsequent trip. So that could also be included. What the language will not do is kind of say exactly where the racks need to be disposed of. But um, within these bounds of the rules, there are some different options that exist. And I know that this is kind of an area of concern as, okay, what are we going to do with all the, with the racks from, from the fish that previously we've been, um, you know, discarding at sea. So the, the primary method would likely be to discard the trips, um, discard the racks at sea on the next fishing trip. Um, many of you take a second trip in the day or are out the next day. And so um, it's likely that one of the more easy ways to dispose of the racks would be just on the next trip prior to fishing commences if that you know last bit of language on the prior slide were to carry forward. Um, I've heard that there's, you know, there there could be those that um, also have a, a recreational lobster um, permit that would want to use the racks to debate to bait their pots on on the next trip. So that would also be allowed under the language. There could be shoreside facilities that are available. Um, Right now, DMF has three um, carcass collection freezers that these provide um, otoliths and lengths for striped bass. Um, there's um, one in uh, Gloucester, one in Harwichport, and and one in Bourne. And you know, we could consider having more of these placed if if that was a um, a beneficial way for for racks to be disposed of without causing an issue. Um, this picture here is of a, a North Carolina a freezer chest that they have as part of their carcass collection program because I didn't have one um, for Massachusetts because ours are not out right now. They, they go out um, they, seasonally. And um, there, you know, another option would be to donate the racks to a pot fisherman to use them as bait. Um, there's been some, you know, pre preliminary discussion about the potential to work with commercial fishing organizations that would be interested in, in getting these racks um, to to use as bait. Um, so we could we could work on that um, if if uh, if possible. And then lastly, you know, it, it would not be um, prohibited for the clientele to take the rack if they so desired. I had that question, so just wanted to make that clear. It doesn't seem likely to me that many of your customers would want to take the rack with them, but it wouldn't be prohibited. Uh, the last part is just talking about that, the clarification of no flaying in the other modes. So again, the current language, you know, doesn't really clear and it doesn't address at what point um, a fish can be processed for consumption. So our intent has been that striped bass should be, um, you know, have their head and tail intact and be otherwise whole except for evis evisceration um, while on the waters of the state or on any parcel of land, structure, portion of a roadway or parking lot abutting tidal waters of the state. So that's some language that kind of blends a couple of different states rules currently and is something that you know we might look to use um, and we've been talking a little bit about some possible exceptions to that that um, may be in play such as if you're um, preparing a fish for immediate consumption on a, on a boat or you know shoreside campground um, or if you're um, cleaning a fish on a public fishing pier, on a, a fish cleaning station, Virginia has that type of allowance. Um, or, you know, if we were to encourage the use of the, the carcass collection freezers and there's a, a fish cleaning station next to them, you'd want someone to be able to flay a, a fish there, of course, in order to put the rack into the, into the freezer. So um, we may need to, you know, be kind of specific in the language as to these type of exemptions that apply. But um, for the people on the call right now, I, I expect that um, the for hire aspect of this is the most um, of most interest. So I'm going to go back to um, this slide um, to take uh, questions and then and then comment. Thanks, Nick. So we don't have any uh, language yet that like that's preferred. And so what Nick has done is sort of collected some analogous language in other jurisdictions and 
we'd like to get um, your thoughts on anything you particularly like. Uh, or I'm sure you don't like any of it, but that you like, uh, the dislike the least, I should say. So, um, you know, let's have a conversation about what's what's practical for your for your businesses or for your fishing style. Paul Diggins. Yes. Hi. Uh, like I said before, I'm a charter boat operator out of uh, Charlestown, Massachusetts. And, you know, when we uh, fillet the striped bass, I mean, myself, we keep the racks or I keep the racks until I'm just ready to pull into the marina. And then I throw them overboard in the deeper water. So, I mean, that's what I've been doing for, I don't know how long, quite a while. So I don't know what everybody else does, but as far as like put them in a box or put in a freezer or any of that other stuff, I really don't want anything to do with any of that. I just want to, you know, dispose of them uh, in the deeper water. So when the tide goes out, uh, hopefully the, the fillets go out with it. Thank you. So Paul, just to clarify, um, I guess in the past or currently your business model has, uh, you dropping the carcasses overboard before you tie up the vessel. Yes. So what we're saying with this with this rule that ASMFC voted on, you would have to have the carcasses when you come in. So when, when if the EPOs want to inspect the the fish and the, and the fillets, you'd have carcasses that can be measured, and then once your customers leave the 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 scene. I guess you could turn around and dump them out in the deeper water, or, or you know, if if you, on if you're taking another trip or on your next trip, or if you're not going to take the another trip that day or the next day, I I guess you'd have to steam out and and drop them, but you know that's what we're talking about here—a a change to your normal handling practices. Yeah, no, I I, I get that. So when when you when you write the the new rules, I'll be in compliance. Because you'll just take them out to deeper water after your clients depart. No, after they depart, I mean, uh, the water at my slip at the marine is thirty five feet, so okay on the outside, so I could just throw it out. You know. Yeah. All right. Okay. We we did get some negative feedback from some operators who told us that. Uh, it's not um, lawful for them to dump carcasses where they tie up. So yeah, that's, I, I, I'm glad it works for you. Okay. Darren Saletta. Darren, you're muted. Darren, I'll come back to you. Kevin Coakley? Uh, yes. Um, I run a charter boat out of Wellfleet, Mass. And I'm in the situation where we can't dump fish in our harbor. So I clean fish and dump the carcasses in deeper water coming in. So... I would have to have under this regulation a separate cooler which takes up deck space in my boat just to hold the carcasses. The way the way that I that the way that I interpret it now is that correct? So they they have to come into shore. Um, I guess it's a question whether or not this language here you know specifies uh, that they're in a container if there's another option that's better um would like to hear that but we don't have any leeway with the carcasses not coming to shore right but my my my, my point is now i have to keep a separate cooler or container in my boat to put the carcasses in because i'm not going to put them into a uh 
ice filled chest that has just fish in it. I don't want to bloody that up. Correct. Okay. I, all, all, I'm, all I'm going to say is I'm not, I, I understand that you don't have any lee, leeway on this, but for myself and only speaking for myself, I'm not happy with this regulation. Thank you, Kevin. Willie Hatch. Um, yeah, in, in our marina, it's totally illegal to throw a carcass in the harbor. It's grounds for dismissal, so that's not an option for us. Uh, in the past, on our way in, we'd cut the fish, throw the racks over the side, kind of wash the boat up. The guys would hit the dock and leave. Uh, I'm thinking, too, I mean, we have, you know, we, have, we pull into a slip. We have eight active charter boats on our slip. So, you know, a bunch of striper racks is going to start to smell pretty rank after a while. But uh, I'm, I really like you guys to consider the guys on the center consoles, too, uh, that a few of our members are in the Cape Cod Charter Boat Association. I know Stellwagen and Bank. Also, these guys, if you've ever been to a boat ramp on Cape Cod in the summer, it is an absolute three-ring circus. And trying to pull in, unload a charter, jump in your, you know, jump in your truck, back it down, load a boat on a trailer. And now you got to deal with dealing with striper racks in the middle of that. Now you're driving away from the, the boat ramp with a bunch of striper racks in the boat. So this has really created a problem where there isn't one, but I realize this is being forced on it. So I'm going to try and be productive. <laughs> um, looking at these options, um, how long must the rack be retained? Uh, I do like until the dock, uh, until the vessel is docked and all the passengers from that trip have left the vessel or area. You know, I like the idea of being able to pull in, get the guys off, off the boat, deal with the carcasses. A lot, a lot of us are on a quick turnaround if we're trying to do two trips, if, if we're dumping them in a dumpster or wherever they're going, uh, hopefully one of those, you know, collection I like the idea of using them for science uh, or for bait. That's a lot more productive than just filling up a landfill somewhere with garbage bags. So that's a productive use of the carcass. Uh, the other thing too, dumping, you know, keeping them on the boat is sometimes we don't want our other clients to see what we caught on the trip before, because maybe that next trip's not going to be so good. And, you know, they see six stripers go over the side and they go out and they catch 10 bluefish on the afternoon trip. Now they're all pissed off. Whereas if they hadn't seen that, they might have been happy. Um, but anyways, um, so being able to dump them as soon as we hit the dock, wherever they're going. And then uh, another thing I wanted you guys to think about, too, is uh, leaving the skin on um, with the ground fish, the cod, the haddock, all the ground fish species uh, were allowed to skin most of the fish as long as we keep a two inch skin tag attached to it. Um, I would like that option for the striped bass if that's possible. I mean, I think it's pretty easy to tell what a striped bass fillet looks like um, even when it is skinned, but leaving that skin tag on would be a big service to our clients that a lot of them are incapable of, uh, you know, skinning a striper fillet. And, you know, a lot of these guys are staying in a hotel Airbnb, whatever. I mean, it's going to make a total mess wherever they're staying. So uh, just think about how, leaving that two inch skin tag as an option. Um, I think that's it. I mean, I'd really like you guys to think about using a digital photograph, you know, down the road. We all have iPhones or some sort of Android device where it's time stamped, dated. You take a picture of the fish on a board. I mean, that should be evidence enough. Um, so that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Rob Savino. Hi, I just wanted to, uh, Rob Savino, I have a charter boat out of Boston. I'm also a member of Still Wagon Bank Charter Boat Association. A lot of guys know me. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the language here. I, I know we got to keep the racks and I'm, I'm okay with that. 
Um, but some of the things that I've always cautioned in the past when we've talked about the language, um, when I see in a separate container unmixed from any other material, I see an opportunity for an EPO guy to give me a ticket or what have you, if they're having a bad day or anything, just because maybe there's some dead mackerel in that container, or maybe there's another fish or another rack in that container, something, something like that. So I think that statement in, in itself just kind of, uh, just kind of leaves for a very gray area and can be problematic. Um, just a thought on that one. Um, the unmutilating, I, I, I get that. And all I guess is, is the rack must remain whole because you want to just be able to measure a rack. I mean, make it simple language, nice and easy. Uh, as far as how long must the racks be retained? You know, I think as soon as the, the passengers leave the vessel is probably the best idea, you know, in the immediate dock area. You know, my dock area is pretty big. So so if they're, they're leaving the dock and an EPO officer catches them, 10 minutes later and they're still on the dock and I've already dumped the racks because he wants to come down and see him. We've have to be careful of, of that language. Uh, so I, I would, I would be more inclined to say as soon as the passengers leave the vessel, it's, I would, I would put it up to the EPO officer to, to meet the vessel or see the vessel coming in or what have you and, and greet the vessel at the dock if he wants to do an inspection of it. A lot of the EPO officers around me know me and, and, and they'll, uh, quite often just ask me to check my stuff out and it's not, it's not that much of a dish issue for them to come down to the boat. Um, the other one, uh, where was it? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm losing the, until the vessel is done. Yeah. So the, the other statement that you have until the vessel is docked and been secured at the end of the fishing trip adequate to provide a law enforcement officer access. Um, that right there sounds like language to me that that is quite gray because what's adequate for one may not be adequate for another. And yet again, leads to interpretation and potential tickets and and fines and, and things like that where you're not really intending them to be. Um, so I would just watch out for that language. That's That's all I have to say really there. Thank you, Rob. Mike Delzingo. Hey, hello, my name's uh, Mike Delzingo. I run a charter boat out of Boston. I'm on the board of directors of the Stellwagen Bank Charter Boat Association, also a member of the Cape Cod Charter Boat Association. Uh, I think this is a, a solution to a problem that doesn't really exist, and I realize we're being forced on it. So my intention is to retain all the racks. I've got a pretty big boat. I would I would plan on keeping all the racks in my floor, uh, possibly for a couple of days. So I would I would like some sort of language that doesn't limit me to the number of racks I'm allowed to have, because uh, you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday I can do nine trips, three, three, and three. And my intention is, you know, at the end of Sunday to give the racks to my lobster buddy or, or you know, give them to somebody for bait. So I, I don't want it that I have to get rid of the racks before I start fishing again. Uh, like someone said before, I might not want my clients to see what, what I caught in the morning. And I, I also want to be clear that I can have you know, say two clients on board and there's, uh, let's say 20, 30 racks in the floor from the previous days or previous trips. Uh, other than that, I think we'll just, just have to, to flow with it as it comes. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, thanks for those comments. Um, we'll, we'll, work to make it as um, practical as possible and the fact that you might be able to put some bait into the into the, the lobster industry is that sounds great so we'll we'll work with you on that
Jared, we got one more, Darren. Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, good afternoon, Darren Saluda. Uh, Monomoy sport fishing runner and mostly out of Chatham. Um, Nick and Dan, um, thank you for putting this together. Uh, as you guys know, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work with you. Um, when I was running Mass Commercial Stripe Bass Association and uh, of course on all the forage fish issues, always a great supporter of best available science. This is one of the most nonsensical regulations I think I've ever seen. And it's, it's nothing but a pain in our butts running a business. Um, I want to echo that, you know, Willie Hatch's comments were outstanding. He brought up a couple I hadn't thought of. So my mistake for missing this at the ASMFC level. So my first question is, how many years do we have to deal with this before we can go back and try to change it again? Because it's, it's ridiculous and it, it's, it's going to hurt. It's going to be a pain in our butt. Is this something that, you know, we're going to have to deal with one year? And you know, the way I'm reading it is like, hey, we don't have a choice here. So how do you want it written up? And um, I'll get to that next. But when can we actually look at changing this back? Hmm. Nick and Mike, I mean, I think all I can say is that um, from a process standpoint, it would take another addendum to the management plan to do so. That's not good. This was really poorly thought out. And I, you know, I can only blame myself for missing it at that level. You know, I, I'm wondering who was there that runs businesses. And, you know, to give you guys an idea of, you know, what some, you've heard what some of the other fellows do. But, you know, I run out of Chatham and uh, when I have the, the two trips back to back, I have 15 minutes in between trips. Chatham prohibits disposal of racks in the harbors as a 15 minute limit on the dock tie up. It's a circus down there in the summertime. And you've got 15 minutes to get your, your clients off, get paid, say your goodbyes, get everybody else on, give them a quick safety briefing and, and get going. Dealing with racks is is just not even not even an issue. And in days when I've had to, you know, they stay in the cooler and they go back out to sea. And that that's essentially what I'm going to have to do. But anything that makes it more difficult or time consuming is impossible. And it, it's it's just, you know, it's a hard enough business to run as is. And to have to add time or or try to tell the dock master that, you know, oh, you gotta do this or you gotta do that, you need more time isn't really an option especially when people are lined up to launch or, you know, do their business. There's, there's two spots for boats where I launch and, and, you know, you got charter boats, you got recreation boats, commercial boats. It's a nightmare. I'm really disappointed to see this. So, you know, as far as what's going to go into the, the writing of the rules, I'd like to see it. Have you guys have no gray areas, very simple, keep it simple, you know, to the point of tie up. Once, we're, once I have a, a rope around the cleat, I'm done. That rack doesn't need to exist. That's it. Keep it simple. Two, as, as Willie mentioned, the skinnings, I mean, skinning's always been a joke. Um, you know, every MEP I've ever known can identify a bass fillet. And there's barely a client that we serve, maybe 1% that actually know how to skin a fish. So, you know, we, most of us don't scale fish on the boats. It makes a mess. It takes time. You know, it's, it's fillet skin them at some point for them and turn them over. Um, most of us take a lot of pride in keeping our boats absolutely spotless. And uh, that's what helps us create a successful business. Uh, you know, my involvement in the, the management over the years, I, I saw the writing on the wall a long time ago and did something that a lot of folks didn't want to do or didn't agree with. And that I set my own bag limit on, uh, on charters of one fish. I've been doing that for five years. And now I've been far more conservative than the regulations require. And yet they're gonna make my business harder to run when I kill far less fish than most anyone. And, and as other guys have mentioned, it's, it's fixing a problem that doesn't exist. You know, the, you're looking at the contingent of fishermen who are the greatest stewards out there and care more about this resource than anyone. We depend on it. 
So keep it simple. Please keep us informed as to what we have to do to, to reverse this regulation in the future. No gray areas, no nothing gray in the writing and nothing more than uh, retention past, you know, that boat hitting the dock, touching the dock. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate your input. Um, all right. I th Dan, I think Eric Morrow, um, he put it in the chat box that he was trying to raise his hand, but maybe couldn't. Okay. Eric? Yes, yes. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I was having an issue here. But um, so I was listening earlier. Um, the, the thing that stood out the most to me is that the client cannot take the rack with them. Um, I might be the only multi-passenger boat involved in a striped bass fishery. I'm not sure if any of the uh, head boats on the Cape do. I don't think they do. Um, serving a little, this is going to be a slippery slope here. Um, I'm serving a different ethnic background. Yeah, um, Eric, I think you might have misunderstood. There's no uh, prevent, nothing to prevent the client from taking the, the rack. Okay, I must have missed that. I thought there was some said that they couldn't take the rack, and they like to make the soup. No, no, time. no. That that would just be one option, you know, for for you is to let the let the, the those okay. clients take racks. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, I have a lot of guys that collect their racks, so I was just making sure. All right, thank you. Yeah, Thanks they're probably me. making a good stock out of it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, that goes to waste. All right, yeah. thank you. I think that's kind of a New York thing too, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, a lot of Asian guys too. They like to talk. Yeah. They want to collect all the heads. Sure. But, um, all, right. all right. No yep. misunderstanding. Okay. Yep. Josh Dumella. Hey, yes. Uh, just following up on what Eric was just talking about. I worked. I've been listening to you guys. I worked for him the last few years. Is there a limit to how many racks those guys can take? Where. Okay, they've got their one stripe of fillets, and they say, hey, well, can I get five or six of the racks at the end of the day? Is that something that's going to be limited? Well, we'd like to hear from you. So, um, you know, obviously, this rule is to uh, prevent, you know, over harvest or harvesting more than what's allowed. But if you don't have the fillets, I can't imagine there'd be a problem. All right, I just want to clear up. Racks. I mean, like, like you're saying, the guys that take the racks. I mean, I've had customers at the end of the day when I'm cutting, they ask specifically to take extra racks just yeah. for that reason. We're no. making or we're doing whatever. So I just want to make sure that's not going to be an issue where we hand a guy a bag with six or seven racks in it and they give him a hard time. No, no. I mean, that was consistent with what Mike Delzingo had commented on that he'd like to take multiple trips racks and, and hand them over to a lobsterman, you know, at, right. at some point in the future. So that's a good comment that we'll try to accommodate. All right. Thanks. That's all I had, guys. Okay. All right. Jared, any more? Not saying anything, Dan. All right. So on the, on the first three issues, I think we had a lot of, um, you know, agreement or consensus and, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, the support um, on some of those issues. I really want to credit, you know, Nicola for doing a, a really great job um, working this issue, not only with our technical staff to develop those options, uh, but also with the other states. Um, you know, she's, she's outstanding. Um, and of course, Mike Armstrong is our uh, Straight Best board member. And... Um, and, and I wanna thank him for all the work that he's done. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to work, um, consider your comments, especially on the striped bass stuff, which is obviously less um, well-baked than some of this other stuff. So um, feel free to send us uh, your thoughts uh, in an email to follow up. You may have been seeing some of these things for the first time tonight or considering them. So, um, you know, sleep on it. Give us uh, give us some follow up information, follow up advice if you'd like. Uh, please do that uh, by what was the date? Was it March sixth? Was the the common period, Jared? March seventh. March seventh. Um, the sooner the better, because 
Uh, we want to get um, all the all the information together to uh, give advice and make proposals to our Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. So, uh, if there's no other other uh, comments or input, um, I guess we'll uh, we'll thank everybody for attending. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this this hearing is closed, and um, and thanks again, everyone. Have a, a great night, and uh, we look forward to your comments if you decide to make them in writing. <laughs>